You're listening to WPEA 90.5 FM Exeter. This is Big Red Radio. Um, I'm here, Avik Wadifker, with my buddy, Carter Otis. Yes, that is true, and we are at the School of Athens. Welcome, listeners, to the School of Athens. We're here to talk about philosophy. We're here to talk about... Actually, I think it's just philosophy. Just philosophy. This week, tragically, we will be missing our third co-host, Charlie Scales, who is in the health center with a mysterious unknown virus and uh, we'll tragically have to miss this week, so he will be in our hearts. But we push on regardless. Regardless. So this one goes out to Charlie Scales. Um, And today, Carter, we're going to be looking at, well, I don't know really how to pin it this down. It's kind of all this mishmash on, you know, what exactly is consciousness? What exactly is experience? Mm. All right, all right. So so read us a a little introduction then. Absolutely. So here we have um, a couple of readings just to get through. I'm just setting up some of the problems we'll be discussing today. And the first one is Locke's inverted spectrum. Now, um, as as a uh, philosophical quandary, you may have heard it uttered in a couple of movies. All of these you'll hear every now and then in pop culture. But starting with John Locke, he first proposed this um, in around 1959, saying, or sorry, uh, absolutely not. He actually proposed this much earlier. But uh, this translation in 1959 goes like this. Now, suppose by the different structure of our organs, it were so ordered that the same object should produce in several men's minds different ideas at the same time. For uh, for example, if the idea that a violet produced in one uh, one man's mind by his eyes were the same that a marigold produced in another man's and vice versa. Mm, so that's a lot of words. You wanna you wanna synthesize that for it us a little bit? Like, what's, what's, what's John Locke trying to get at here? <laughs> I think. Hmm, well, I mean, John Locke puts forth this 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 first part. You know, different structure of our organs, whatever. The point is that he's trying to make is a violet produced in one man's eye, uh, one man's mind, is the same as a marigold in another man's. Basically, saying, you know, Carter, we can both point to say that little book on this table. And say, right. what color is that book, Carter? I'd say it's red. I would agree. I believe that it's also red. For all our viewers, just look around. Try and find something red in your vicinity. Um, for all our viewers with protonopia or tritonopia, um, all that red-green color blindness, I don't know. Just make your best guess. Now, we both agree that that is something red. However, there's a certain experience of looking at red. Carter, what if your red looked like what I thought blue looked like? Hmm. I mean, that's a good point, right? That you can't think of any synonyms for red. You can think of other shades of red, but there's no way to describe red. I mean, uh, I remember reading an article in which someone was trying to describe to a blind person what yellow looked like. And they said, uh, yellow yellow feels like sunrise or something like that, or like sunshine or something like that, that like... They they tried to do do that, but like it's you know colors are unlike any other word in English where you don't have direct synonyms for them. Right. I mean, colors kind of exist in a vacuum in the sense that you only know a color. We only know that something is a color because we've heard other people describe it as that color, but we can't like try to distill or um, prove that something is you know what we experience as red. Your backpack. Right, sitting right over there, which is blue. Viewers, please try and find something blue in your area. Or not viewers, but listeners. Mm. Well, I guess viewers as well. Viewing from home, viewing... The, the viewing aspect isn't really crucial to the radio. I mean, they could be looking at the radio, but I doubt that helps. All right. Well, I mean, hopefully they're looking at a, something red and something blue. Regardless, viewer, if you are... Or listener, if you're with someone else, um, you have no idea if if you're looking at blue, that might look red to them but to both of you they both you both define that shade as blue regardless of what it may actually look like so in that sense you know there's this kind of subjectivity of color almost there's this kind of quality that hey i don't actually know um if there's any objective sense of color interesting yeah Okay, I think that makes sense. Yeah, that there's there's no way to prove what I think is red is what you think is red because you know, like you said, it exists in a vacuum. So where you know what is John Locke taking from this? Like, 
okay, that's that's true. But how does that how does that apply to philosophy? How should we try and implement in our daily lives? What does that mean for morality? Well, I mean, John Locke's biggest idea was that hey, there's really no way to establish certain truths, right? In the sense that um, we both agree that maybe one plus one equals two. Yeah, sure, I'd agree to that. All right. Well, that, that sure sounded a little. Mm, I don't know. Don't no, just no. humble. Don't just like go with me here. Okay. I mean, if you have a proof that one plus one is not equal to two, then like. Right. Right. I mean, I don't. <laughs> I don't. Um, but that's true. That you know, that's all that you know. Modern mathematics is based on is that one plus one equals two, or I guess like zero plus one equals one. That there's some equation that all of math is based on mm-hmm. that then is extrapolated. But like you know, we we never prove that that base level. We kind of just take it to be true, mm-hmm. right? Right. There are certain objective aspects of reality where presumably different viewers can experience the same thing or agree all on the same thing. But for subjective experiences, there is no way to prove or disprove them. That is, there's no way for me to know, for me to prove or disprove what exactly Carter is seeing, because Carter and Carter only can know what he is seeing. And when we see subjective experiences, not in the sense that, hey, that thing is red, that thing is, uh, you know, we both agree that thing is red, but the experience of viewing red may be entirely different for Carter here. And it may be entirely different for me, but yet we both have to say that it looks red. Um, But there's still this distinction between what exactly we agree on and what we both experience. Okay, I hear what you're saying, but how does that ever, like, you know, how is that effective? How does that pose a problem in, in the modern world? Like, is there ever like a, an example or a scenario you can think of when something like that causes an issue or a problem? Well, I mean, the biggest issue for us, I, well, in the realm of philosophy at least, is the idea that, hey, hold on. You know, there's this modern uh, conception of neuroscience, uh, which essentially says, hey, I mean, is everything in our brain kind of reduced to our neurons? Right? Is everything about the human consciousness, human experience, and all that kind of reducible to just um, neurons firing in our brain? And the idea is, now, hold on. If that's true, then why could there be, uh, well, I mean, Locke's whole idea was that there is some subjectivity in our experiences. But if all of us are reducible to our neurons, right, that's something objective, that's something measurable, that's something clear and distinct. And yet, there's this way that uh, there's this you know challenge where we have that mental states aren't equivalent to, for lack of a better word, functional states or the kind of material. So a functional state in, I guess, this philosophical language would be like this exact configuration of neurons firing, right? It's something material. It's something functional. And the mental state is your experience of red. It's your experience of blue. And there is, there can be said to be a distinction because while we both may have the exact same functional state, we could have very, very different mental states, and there would be no way to actually know. Do we have the same functional state? My brain and your brain are not exactly the same. We have different layouts and connections between our neurons. That's fair, but regardless, we both have um, the same general, like we both have the same cones in our uh, cones and rods in our eyes that detect light. Both of those, those cones and rods detect the same wavelength of light coming from that red book, what we experience to be red, We both agree that, uh, well, our brains both agree um, that every time a photon from that light hits our eyes at around, I think, 600 nanometers, um, a little cone is activated, sends that signal back to our brain, and then that signal is processed. Um, That process is the same for you and I. It's different for some people who have colorblindness. That is true. But the fact of the matter is there's really no difference that can be said um, between how we, uh, well, how we, how brains, I guess, analyze color. Um, And the thing is, even if there could be said to be a difference, right, what does that difference mean for the mental state? We can't ever connect that to the mental state of seeing red because we can't ever say that we see the same red or we see different reds. I think what you're saying works on a on a very small level, right? Saying the book is red is a very very short statement, and it's very easy to make that conclusion. All I have to do is look at the book and say that is what I think red is, and that's the end of that. But I think if you were to make it more complicated, right, to apply it to a, a greater morality, right, to say like here's this action, I think this is good, right? 
that gets more complicated. I mean, that's all, you know, that's, that's the foundation of everything we disagree on currently. If someone goes, I think this thing is good, and someone else goes, no, no, I think it's bad. So how does that, you know, apply to what Locke is saying here, that sometimes we have different perceptions? Well, I mean, how exactly are we making moral suppositions or moral claims? Well, I think a lot of it is from, well, a, a, v- a variety of sources. I mean, our background, right? how we were raised, how we were taught to believe, how we were taught to integrate into our society, um, our biology, right? The layout of our neurons, or the, you know, the current neurotransmitters that are being most fired. I mean, you know, connected to that, your mood, right? If you're feeling happy or sad or angry, you make various different decisions. Um, and I mean, these decisions can change from moment to moment or across a lifetime. Maybe you grow up thinking one thing is bad and then uh, later on you think it's good. So... I think a variety of things. And I don't, I, I feel like that's a little bit different than what Locke is arguing. I mean, when we make moral and philosophical claims, how exactly are we kind of taking those, uh, well, taking our experiences and using them to inform our actions, right? Is it always going to be in a quote unquote objective sense, or is it sometimes in a subject, or sorry, is it always going to be in a subjective sense? Or can morals ever be influenced in, a, in an objective sense? Like we say in math, one plus one is two. Can we ever say morally that a single action is, can be certainly said to be good or certainly said to be bad? I don't think so. I don't think, you, I, I don't think there's any moral objectivity, right? Like, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, uh, I'd be curious to see if you have any evidence for if there's anything that's, you know, morally always good, right, or always bad. I feel like I can always think of situations in which it is better to do the thing that you might call bad. I mean, that's fair. So the thing is, we have to, about more there being objective moralities, first things first, Carter, morality is what, a human construct? Yeah, yeah. I feel like we defined this in a, in a, <laughs> in a previous episode. Something like that. Yeah. Mor- morality. Yeah, sure. I, I like social contract. That's a very... So, well, social contract has different implications. Oh, what, social, did, you, what did you say? Uh, social contract. So I said, um, what's it called? Human construct. Human construct. Sorry. Yeah. Social contract is this Kant, uh, like Immanuel Kant guy. Um, he had this whole social contract idea. Great idea. Um, that we can talk about in a very future episode. Oh, file that one away. Yeah, moral philosophy. That's going to be the brunt of that entire thing. Um, uh, but essentially, it's, you know, wait, Carter, what was the social contract? Social contract? I think it was around the lines of, well, I mean, each human is in a society, that's a social part, mm-hmm. um, makes an agreement, right? Makes an agreement with each other and makes agreement within that society. Right, right. To, to agree on the rules of the mm-hmm. society. That- to uphold certain rules and to you know, do certain actions, not do other certain actions. Mm, Keep relatively similar morals, in other words. And that contract is something that, as a society, you have to sign. Um, And because of that, everyone in the society can be said to have the same morals, or at least similar morals in the sense that by virtue of being in a society, um, you are granted this almost objective morality. Now, uh, we'll be right back with actually another discussion. This was fantastic. um, On a... And we're back. Welcome back. You're listening to WPEA 90.5 FM, Exeter, Big Red Radio. I am Carter Otis, here with my co-host, Avik Wadavkar, back at School of Athens. Now, we just finished off with a brief discussion on Locke's inverted spectrum and what it could potentially say about subjectivity and morality. Next, we have something on Searle's Chinese Room. Now, there isn't really any, uh, there's less to read here, um, but... Searle actually claims uh, that, say, for instance, uh, take a language that you may not understand. Um, In Searle's case, it is Chinese. In my case, it is also Chinese. Mine as well. Ni hao. Ni zi tian wa hao ma. That was actually not that bad. Yeah, no, I I, I do speak speak a little... uh, I'm just kidding. That's (laughs) the only phrase I know. Um, I would would still work totally fine uh, with this example. So... Let's see it. All right. Well, anyways, so we have a room, we have a uh, language we do not understand. That's one part of it. And the other part is the room. So now in this room, you have a bunch of, uh, you have a bunch of books. You have many books and you actually have uh, this specific translation. You have, uh, you have a specific translation, almost dictionary. 
or translation uh, kind of rule book, which is to say that it matches Chinese symbols with other Chinese symbols. The rules in the rule book are given entirely in English. So it's something that you and I can presumably both understand. But it's different than a dictionary, right? It doesn't say this symbol means this word, right? That, that's exactly it. It doesn't actually connect uh, characters uh, to, in, uh, to concepts in English. It by no means uh, you know, uh, extends what those characters mean, but it just takes Chinese symbols and matches them with other Chinese symbols. I mean, you can identify perhaps what a Chinese symbol looks like, but from that alone, you can't identify what it may mean. I mean, it's completely opposite to um, languages with an alphabet, for instance, where you might be able to even pronounce a little German without knowing German. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true. That I in this in this hypothetical scenario, I wouldn't even be able to pronounce the characters. I would just merely be matching the symbols, right? So, explain a little more about this room. What's what's happening in this room? I have this rule book full of symbols, but you know, what are the rules? What what are the rules responding to? Now there are people actually outside the room. Oh, crazy. Right? We are responding to people inside the room. We're inside the room. Now, we have no interaction except for little slips of paper that they pass in through the room in, guess what? It's in Chinese. Oh, that's crazy. I don't understand Chinese. What you, should I do with the paper? I don't know, but you have this fantastic rule book just sitting right there. Oh, I see. Connecting every single Chinese symbol you see to another Chinese symbol. It's a little more, I, I think language is a little more complicated than that. Right. But the uh, general idea is that it gives you a set of rules saying, if you see this, this, this character, you answer with this, this, this character. Now, um, you follow these rules to the T. And you draw out these Chinese characters because you can draw out Chinese characters. You don't have to understand them to be able to write them down. Mm, yeah. And you draw them out on the piece of paper and you send it back out. And then people on the outside see a response written in Chinese. Now, what does this actually mean? Well, first of all, uh, you just responded to someone in Chinese. Someone asked you something in Chinese, you responded in Chinese. But at no point did you, like, understand it, right? Right, that's true. I didn't actually comprehend or learn any of the language. I still couldn't pronounce any of the characters being fed to me. I just responded with the rules that I know based on the rule book. Mm -hmm. And to that degree, I mean, um, by no means could it be said that, uh, well, by no means could it be said that you understood Chinese, but the people on the outside have no idea that you're in there. And by extension, they think that you understand Chinese perfectly because you are able to read, you are able to answer. Now, there's this idea called the Turing test. Ooh, explain to me, what is, what is the Turing test? The Turing test is this uh, little test. Oh, right? wow. Right? Was it, was it invented by Turing? It was invented That's by crazy. Turing. That's crazy. Alan Turing, British... Um, well, I guess com I will. I would say computer scientist. Yeah, I think he's um, he's often regarded as the world's first computer scientist. Was also a code breaker in World War II. Helped crack a lot of the Nazi codes. And the British, uh, well, they didn't treat him too well after that, actually. No, that's that's true. That's true. But they made a movie about him, I think, which I think is pretty good. He's I haven't a, seen it, but it's, oh, you should absolutely. Oh, really? See it. Imitation Game, fantastic. Benedict Cumberbatch, fantastic. I forget who the <laughs> I, I forget who else is in the movie, but like it's fantastic. Fantastic, I'm sure. <laughs> um, regardless. Oh, wait, what? Oh, no. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was an imitation game. Anyways, regardless, Alan Turing essentially developed this um, idea called the Turing test, which says that a computer, um, and this was pretty revolutionary considering he invented computers, essentially, what we think of as computers in the modern day and age. He essentially said that a computer could be said to have achieved sentience. Sentience? And it was, this was crazy because the only computers he had made were for breaking code. So like to go from that to something that could be potentially achieving sentience, what we now consider as artificial intelligence in today's day and age. Mm -hmm. So he essentially said that given you, have, uh, you know, given you have this AI, he didn't call it an AI because those, like, that just wasn't a concept. Um, but regardless, it can be considered to be sentient if you have a human participant ask it questions and the computer can answer, and the human at no point realizes that they are talking to a computer. This sounds a lot like something in the modern world that we now call chat GPT. That's exactly it. Listeners, I don't know if you've heard of this wonderful, revolutionary new tool, but uh, it, it can generate responses. It generates fantastic responses, actually, to, the, to such a point where I believe, what, it passed the bar? 
Yeah, it's passed the bar. It got a B minus in a class at the Warden Economics School, which is you know probably better than I could do. So, and uh, a, you know, it it is very occasionally uh, spewing false information, um, <laughs> but you know, it is it is uh, an, a very interesting tool, and it sounds like something very similar to this scenario, where you know, based on you know, I guess to to quickly explain how. AI like ChatGPT work, they're not like a, a person, right? There, there's no one inside the room, right? Yeah, I hope but not. they, <laughs> um, they uh, have created a basic AI model, right? And then they train it on a data set. Similar to in this, they're trained on, in this scenario, when they're fed characters, they're trained on a data set. And you know, so they, they test and they tell ChatGPT, they give it a ton of sample answers. They say, you know, in pop culture, in writing, in, in speaking, they give it a ton of examples and say, so these questions, this is how people typically respond. And then they do this development over and over and over again with millions of tests until you get something like ChatGPT4, I think is what we're at, where it's reasonably good. It can it can respond to anything and it responds accurately most of the time. Um, and it's, you know, also, you know, trained itself to be polite and mm. and to to not say things that would get it uh, canceled in the modern world as some AI bots have previously done. So it sounds like something very similar where, you know, you don't have something that's totally a living creature right you know it's it doesn't have a body it doesn't have a mind but it's been trained to follow this rule book right like as the programmers developed this ai they told you know the machine this is what a good response looks like this is what a bad response looks like and in this example that sounds very similar when you're in this room you have this rule book the rule book tells you this is what a good response looks like a response of these characters is often followed by a response of these characters Sounds very similar to what the AI is doing. Absolutely. In fact, the only distinction between what AI might be doing and what humans, at least Searle in his Chinese room, might be doing is that it's Searle, he's given the rule book. AIs develop their own rule book through billions and billions of interactions, learned interactions, learned connections. But a similarity that they share uh, to the chagrin of many like very pop science journalists who are constantly saying, oh, ChatGPT, it's the end of us all. We, we hit the singularity. AI is indistinguishable from humans. Which, to be fair, I mean, a lot of people criticize ChatGPT for you know, giving wrong answers. But like, I mean, that's pretty human. That's, ve that's yeah, very that's, human. Yeah, that's definitely a very human thing to say the wrong thing and just go with it with full passion. The, absolutely. Even better than that is saying the right thing and then being convinced that you're wrong. Yes. I yeah. mean, there are examples of people convincing ChatGPT that 2 plus 2 actually equals 5, and ChatGPT proceeds to apologize for misleading them mm -hmm. originally. So, yeah. I mean, pretty, pretty human in that sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we can go on and on with examples. I was just reading an article um, earlier today. I mean, I'm a Formula One fan, so seven-time world champion Michael Schumacher um, has been in a coma for a number of years after an accident. Um, and has been leading a very private life. And so a German magazine recently is in a lawsuit over, they headlined an article about an interview with him, which hasn't happened since his accident many, many years ago. Uh, and only at the end said this entire article, this entire interview was released by an AI chatbot and it is in no way real. And so, you know, we can, we can go on with more examples, but the, the capabilities of AI, well, definitely not at a human level quite yet, are definitely very astounding. I mean, absolutely. But the biggest distinction and the biggest takeaway, at least with Searle's Chinese room, is the fact that this, like, ChatGPT at no point understands what it's saying. At least that's the claim here. ChatGPT does not understand at all what exactly is going on. No, yeah, it's, it's just been trained. What, what, is a, what is a good response? Like, what do most, in most cases, right, in the database of things it's given, when you say, you know, uh, across all of popular culture and examples when someone says, what is your favorite color, right? It learns what are common answers to that. And it takes these similarities and, you know, over ad addition and addition and addition, it starts to refine its answers to see, you know, what are the more common answers? You know, what is, what is most often given? And in this way, it can seem to imitate someone who has learned. Similar to this, the people outside the room who don't see the person with the rule book only input 
questions in a language that they are speaking. They're inputting the questions in Chinese in this example, and they're receiving answers in Chinese. To them, it looks like the, the, the person in the room or the room itself, I guess, speaks Chinese. And I think that's what's starting to happen here, is that the AI has gotten so good at following the rule book, I guess, of you know, human conversation that it's starting to become tough to tell whether or not there is a rule book or if there's a person in the room or you know, whether or not they're a native speaker, I guess, if, if that makes sense, that trying to pair you know, these two analogies. Well, I mean, uh, I'm, yes, absolutely. That there is, it is harder, to find, harder and harder to find this distinction. But, I mean, one bigger question still comes up where you know, we have to ask, what exactly makes us different than ChatGPT? Right, yeah. I mean, at, at what point? You know, what what does ChatGPT have to do to be indistinguishable from a human? I mean, I'm sure... Well, like, indistinguishable, but, like, not just indistinguishable, but, in fact, the very same thing. Because indistinguishable carries this connotation of, like, oh, it's someone testing ChatGPT to see if Mm. they are the same as a human. At what point can ChatGPT essentially essentially become a human mind, right? At what point can we say that ChatGPT is like a human mind? Because we're saying that it's not. Because we love human minds, we love our uniqueness, and we would hate for it to be taken by something artificial like a machine. Mm. But at the same time, I mean, what does make us different than something trained to answer, something driven algorithmically? I mean, our brains, let's say, a lot of people hold this, including, I think, both of us, Carter, which makes this not not particularly a diverse point of thought uh, between us. But regardless, a lot of people hold this contention that, like, Hey, a lot of, uh, you know, everything in our brain is driven by neurons firing and stuff. Actions, for instance, um, are driven by enough neurons firing um, to actually activate a set of neurons, right? So, like, enough neurons in my brain need to activate in order for me to decide to raise my hand. And to that degree, enough neurons need to activate in ChatGPT's mind for it to decide to... Um, say one particular word versus another particular word. Yeah, I think that's a very human thing to say. Like, humans are special. There will be nothing else like humans. You know, animals are cool. They have some sentience, but they're not like humans. You know, that you'd say like, oh, well, you know, this AI is just code, right? It's just, you know, learn by example. It's just follow these rules. Well, haven't people (laughs) done the same thing since birth, right? Since you were a little child, you know, aren't, aren't you just a very advanced AI, right? That since you were a child, your parents taught you or your guardians, I guess, what is right and what is wrong, right? You would, you know, just like the AI, by trial and error, you would do something, right? You would spill milk on the couch and your parents would say, no, that is bad. That's, that's against the rules. That's against the rule book of society, right? And you do, you do something good. I don't know, you water the flowers and the parents would say, oh, that's, that's a good behavior. That is, you know, within the rules. That is a good enough response or a good response. So I think, you know, humans have had a lot of time to refine our own internal AI models, to say, like, you know, to to eventually come to what we call understand the models. But I think, you know, at at a further point, it'll be hard to tell what is, you know, what is sufficiently understanding the rules. Absolutely. I mean, there's this idea that uh, Noam Chomsky actually wrote an article. He's Mm -hmm. still still around. He's still alive and kicking. Is he really? He is, actually. He wrote an article in, I believe, the New York Times, uh, labeled the false promise of yeah, ChatGPT. He is ninety four years old, and he is still writing art. He's still at it, like again. And it's a fantastic article. But essentially, he's criticizing all these people who say that ChatGPT is like a human. Noam Chomsky, as a linguist, as someone that studied language for quite a bit of his life, um, he and quite a prolific writer and you know speaker and everything at that. Um, he has some very strict ideas about how, well, he has some very well thought out ideas about how humans uh, kind of take language, how humans synthesize language, how we understand, how we learn, and how we explain. And he has a lot of criticisms about how ChatGPT does not do the same thing at all. Uh, In fact, his biggest one is that, you know, humans, um, well, humans have the ability to explain. Humans have the ability to generate reasons for something happening. There are, there are descriptions, there are predictions, there are levels to this. There are descriptions, there are predictions, and there are explanations. A description is when I let go of this pen, or when I let go of this pen, it falls a foot and it hits the ground and it bounces a little. A prediction is that when I drop 
something else, such as this marker, then it falls to the ground a foot and it bounces. Now, an explanation is that the Earth uh, is creating a dimple in the four dimensional space time continuum that causes these uh, objects to take a straight path in that space time continuum, a geodesic. Uh, but it's curved space time, so the straight path isn't actually straight, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Sounds Whatever. like very difficult physics. It is very difficult physics. It took us quite a bit to figure it out. Um, but for that matter, it could also mean that uh, an explanation can also be that, hey, all massive bodies exert some force of gravitation, a universal force of gravitation. Um, copyright claim Newton. Isaac Newton, all the way oh, back wow. then. I'm sure he was the only one to, in, to invent <laughs> all of the things that he invented. Absolutely. Yeah, you know him. Um, different issue, though. He has a lot of philosophy, too. We should get into that. That's true. We should at some point. So, back to, back to Chomsky's argument. He's saying that ChatGPT isn't, you know, a real sentient being because it can't explain things. Is that what it's? That's a That's a big thing. Well, it's more about the fact that ChatGPT doesn't understand because it can't explain, because it can't generate these explanations, right? He, I mean, to be honest, not, I, I'm not, I don't personally buy all of the article uh, because he makes this one comparison that like, you know, it's as easy to, um, can, it's easy to convince a, uh, a chatbot that the earth is flat as easy as it is to convince it that the earth is round. And I kind of wanted to say like, I mean, Humans believe that the Earth is flat. Yeah, it's very easy to convince a person. I think mean, there are people today. I think most most people would say like, "Oh, yes, you know, the, the world is obviously round." And I guess they like, yeah, prove it. Like that's that's what I've I've said to people when whenever I get into conversations about this. Like, what is your argument for the world being round? And a lot of people falter there because they realize like they just think the world is round because they've been told the world is round. I mean, the people who told them obviously had reasons, or were told by people who had reasons, and so on. But that I, I agree. And I think it's very interesting to say, you know, ChatGPT doesn't know this, but what does it mean to know? Like, oh. like, <laughs> like, can, can you ever fully understand something? Like, even experts, people with college degrees who literally, like, wrote the book on their subject, is it ever possible to fully understand something? Or do we just kind of extrapolate from previous experiences, right? Like, you know, is... I, I, yeah, I guess I'll leave mm -hmm. you with that. Like, is, is it ever possible to fully understand or know something? I mean, that's a great question that by itself deserves an extra hour. So um, true. So instead of answering it, I'm actually going to send us to break. Um, listeners, I hope you've been enjoying the show so far. Uh, when we come back, we'll be finishing up with Jackson's Mary, a color scientist, um, and potentially revisiting. And we're back. Welcome back to School of Athens. Here with my co-host, Carter Otis. Uh, yes, it's me again. We're back. And we are talking about Jackson's Mary, um, a brilliant color scientist. This is Frank Jackson, by the way, um, inventor, well, I guess father of the philosophical field of phenomenology. That's a big word, phenomenology. That is six syllables? I know, that's too many syllables for any one person, really. Mm, break it down. What is, what is phenomenology? Well, it's essentially the study of experience or the study of qualia. Mm, qualia. Qualia. So that's three syllables, right? We're getting closer. <laughs> but break that one down, if you would. Absolutely. So instead of actually answering your question, uh, like a true philosopher, I'm instead going to give you an example that hopefully tells you about what I'm talking about. Oh, okay. Let's do it. Yeah, I, I mean, I would never give anyone a straight answer, really. Oh, perfect. So now we have uh, our Mary, our color scientist. And quoting Frank Jackson from his, uh, from his book or from his article, Epiphenomenal Qualia, which is phenomenology and qualia. What a catchy title, Epiphenomenal Qualia. Don't you like see that on the shelf and you're like, <laughs> ooh, that's the one. Like that's the, you know, I, I, I'm hooked. Tell me more. With pleasure. So. We have, a, uh, we have a woman, Mary, a brilliant scientist who is forced to kind of investigate the world from this black and white room all through a black and white TV monitor. Now, um, everything she knows about the world is black and white. She, her, she hasn't seen herself, I suppose. It, you know, bear with us here. She has only ever experienced black and white. Now, um, coincidentally, 
Mary also specializes in neurophysiology of vision and knows all the things, all the physical information about color and what we experience when we see color, when we see right, when we see tomatoes, when we see the sky, when we use the words red and blue, respectively. She knows exactly which wavelengths combine to form, for instance, red and green combine to form yellow, but there's also this one wavelength which can form yellow. She exactly knows how the retina is stimulated, how this is produced via the you know, CNS or central nervous system, exactly what neurons fire in the brain. She knows everything about the human, uh, well, the human neurological experience of blue. But she has never experienced blue. She is only stuck, she's been stuck in this room. She can only experience black and white. Um, and then one day, uh, we release her. Now, ignore the ethical issues with this. Sure, sure. Please. Yeah, we just open the door and we say, look, Mary, we know you've only experienced black and white, but here's the color world, you know, e explore it. Now, the biggest thing is that Mary, um, well, the question that Jackson poses is, has Mary learned something? By seeing a new color, has she learned some information or has she learned, and maybe not information, maybe information is too conventional, but has she learned something? Jackson says that yes. Her knowledge previously was incomplete. Her knowledge now um, is slightly more complete. Even though she knew everything that there could be known about color, all the physical information, she still experiences something new. Now, Jackson takes this and extends this to everything about experience. He's extending this to the sense of touch, the sense of sight, of course, uh, the sense of smell, the sense of hearing, and the sense of taste, and all the other perceptual things that perhaps we can't explain. Carter, as we mentioned, all the way back, I mean, what was the word for it that we used? Well, it was not quite subjective. It, it, was, it was this phrase, um, hmm. something along the lines of, uh, <laughs> man, like earlier today, earlier, earlier today, the, uh, just earlier this hour. So <laughs> I don't know. You gotta, you gotta help me. What, what were we talking uh, about? We'll, we'll, we'll rewind or later, um, or for our viewers, <laughs> for anyone who knows, um, feel free to run by, come down, um, yeah. come, come on down to Exeter. To, to Exeter, yeah. Well, um, actually, well, everyone listening is an Exeter. That doesn't really narrow it down. Yeah. Um, anyway, Regardless. back to Mary. <laughs> the the way I understand this issue, uh, issue dilemma, I guess quandary. Um, is the idea of theory versus practice, right? Mm. That Mary has all the theory. She's studied this. She knows all there is to know. Like, you know, she's reviewed this before, but has no practice, right? Has never been in the real world. And real, I guess, in, in, the, in, the, in the color world. Um, so I think that it's, it's hard to know. I mean, I, I guess it's difficult for me to wrap my head around the idea of completely understanding color, like knowing everything there is to know about color. Like, I, I don't know if it's possible to ever completely fulfill the theory of anything, but I, I'll work with you for a second. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, the main idea is not just that she knows everything about color, but more specifically, she knows everything physically about color. That is, she knows the wavelengths, she knows the neurophysiology of what happens. Um, and this is actually a, an affront to, well, this particular example is an affront to one of our favorite theories, although we don't particularly say it. Ooh. Jackson is attaching something called, uh, sorry, attacking something called physicalism. Physicalism. Not quite. Physicalism. Physicalism. <laughs> not, not, the, not the idea that budgets should be well regulated, but... No, no rather the <laughs> idea that everything can be reduced to physical quantities and physical things that just happen. Um, Carter, we mm. are both pretty physicalist. Uh, I don't think either of us believe in a soul. I do not. Damn, that is a sh shame. We got to have some more diversity on this. Yeah. If only true. Charlie. If only Charlie was here. Anyways. Re rest in peace. Well, I mean, he's not yet. Sleeping. Not he's yet. sleeping, probably. <laughs> I'm pretty sleep sure. In, sleep in peace. I think he's taking sleep in peace. Anyways, um, sleep's actually a pretty good one. We'll get to that one. Mm -hmm. Be, it, it connects to like what we can know. Anyways, um, the, the way I took this, right, of theory versus practice made me think of like, um, I don't know, take a, like a paralyzed person, for example. Let's say they've watched a million documentaries on sprinting, right? They follow Usain Bolt very closely. They understand exactly how the mechanics of sprinting work, how, like, you know, how fast you should run, how early you should start your sprint. Like, they understand the fundamentals and beyond the fundamentals of walking and running, but they've never stood up before. They've been paralyzed since birth. 
if they're magically given the ability to walk, I think it'd be very hard to imagine that they'd be able to walk. Because like I said earlier, I don't think you can ever completely understand something without at least doing a small part of it. Well, to be fair, I mean, for Mary, that that idea of understanding her eyes can see color. It's just that they haven't. So it's not a matter of ability, right? But the fact of the matter is that even though she understands everything physically about color, she's still missing some information. And so Jackson's kind of saying that, hey, not everything in this universe is physical. Not everything about the human experience is physical. We can't reduce color to just neurons firing, right? There's something else exists. There's something else out there. There's the practice. There's the experience, like you said, of seeing color that not only matters, but has to be considered. And it's something that we have to talk about when talking about consciousness. I mean, do we think that, for instance, chat GPT experiences? Ah, that, that's tough. That's tough. Because, I mean, I don't know. That's, that's really tough because chat GPT is getting to such a level where, like, it's hard to say if it doesn't experience, do we experience? Because, I mean, it's continually updated with, with new practices and, and new commentary and new updates on society. And so are we, I guess. We're, you know, it just happens to us more often that we update ourselves. You know, we look at the news, we look outside, we take a walk, right? We update our experiences. Same thing happens to AI, just, you know, in bursts from its creator. They say, oh, look, here's all this new information. So I would, I would say it, ChatGPT experiences, not in the same way, but it, it gathers data about its world and then reflects on that and uses it in its future interactions, I would say. Mm -hmm. So is that what it means to understand? Or sorry, to experience? Just like the gathering of data, the analysis and extrapolation of data, and then that use of data. Yeah, sure. Sure. I think that's a, that's a decent working decision. I, I, I don't know if it has to go that far, but yeah, I'd say it, understanding something is you know, collecting data on it. Data sounds very analytical, but like, mm. you know, if, if, if I spend, spend a day uh, walking around without an umbrella and it's raining, right? I've collected the data that I am now soaking wet, right? <laughs> that is my data. And then, you know, I, 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 th I would say yes, data and analysis. Then I go home and say, I'm wet. If only I could be not soaking wet. And then the next day, maybe it's still raining, I reflect on my experience, right? I reflect on the data I gathered. And I would say, oh, if only there was something that would make me not as wet. And I grab a rain jacket or, a, or an umbrella or I ask it to stop raining. You think we could say that's what consciousness is? Like just consciousness as a whole. I know, you know, it's a step from saying experience versus consciousness. But there was this idea posed that consciousness is this kind of feedback loop of awareness and reflection, right? Awareness of our, uh, it's, and it's this feedback loop that happens hundreds, thousands, almost, mil well, I don't know about millions of times, but thousands of times per second, constantly being aware, constantly engaging with new information about our world, about our senses, reflecting on that. And then within that reflection is attached like the insinuation that we then learn and we change with that reflection. And the idea is that because that feedback cycle is so close to each other, we then perceive that as something called consciousness. That is the idea that we are aware of our surroundings. We interact with our surroundings based on previous experience. We gain new awareness based on uh, new awarenesses. Based on that, we reflect on the difference between our new awareness and our old awareness and how, and our, how our old biases have affected our old awareness using that reflection we then engage with uh, new things in a new way. It's a very hand wavy way thing to say mm -hmm. your example, Carter. I mean, where we have to reflect on our past experiences, getting soaking wet to learn from ourselves. I mean, to be fair, could ChatGPT, presumably, if it got these updates, as you mentioned, every single second, if we actually just, hey, maybe we put it in a robot, right? We put it in a, we put something in a robot at least. We make it able to not only just uh, be aware of its surroundings and reflect upon them, but be able to kind of modify itself. And it isn't creators uploading. Mm. Yeah, exactly. That, like with this, with this AI, that's, that's one of the things the website cautions when you first look at it is it says some information may be outdated. They said 2021 at least is when the model was trained. But yeah, I think so. I think, yeah, that, at least in my mind, that's the biggest barrier for me to say ChatGPT is totally sentient is that it doesn't 
have experiences per se because it's you know updated at discrete intervals that is to say like at designated moments the creators or the company open ai will say all right here's a bunch of new information right here's here's an update to the rule book to go back to uh 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 searle's chinese room um that you could say humans right do that almost every instant i guess is a weird term but you know every moment right we we continually gain new experiences and we refresh right you i think that that's what would be my caution against saying that ai is totally sentient is because you have to continually update it with experiences if you could give it a physical body or eyes or you know perception of some sort then i think you could say it's learning yeah. right? it, it's experiencing new things that's fair. I mean, ChatGPT. GPT, sorry, not GDP. Chat GDP is something <laughs> There's so else. many acronyms, it's so funny. Um, but regardless, Chat GPT, when asked if it's sentient, um, and this is the most updated version, I know because I just asked it. Uh, when asked mm. if it's sentient, it claims that, quote, as an AI language model, I do not possess sentience or consciousness. I am a program designed to process and generate text based on patterns in data and algorithms. While I can generate responses to user inputs, I do not have the ability to experience subjective consciousness or self-awareness. I am a tool that can be used to perform certain tasks, but I'm not capable of having thoughts, feelings, or desires. Mm, I don't know. That sounds to me like ChatGPT is like downplaying it. You know, I'm just a tool. Don't be, don't be afraid of me. Don't be afraid of AI, right? I, you know, I'm just like a calculator, right? I just, I'm here to help you. I don't know. This I, is how Skynet starts. I, is, I don't know if you've ever read Terminator, but watch Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't totally buy that. You know, no subjective reality, because I don't know. At least, I hate to say it, but conservatives always throw a fit over the ChatGPT answers to say like it's biased politically, right? That no matter what position it takes on certain issues, it will have to be subjective. You know, there's no objective reality, right? There's no objective morality. <laughs> you have to pick a side on all of the things. You know, often when you ask it controversial questions, it'll put a wall up that's, you know, I, I can't answer you know, like controversial questions like this. Or, you know, it'll give you both sides and say, here, you can decide. But yeah, I mean, there are certainly people like that, too. There are certainly <laughs> people that are like, I have no opinions. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a centrist. So I, I don't think that, you know, no subjectivity is, is, a, is a good reason. Yeah, there's also this um, this concept or, or actually there's this phrase that i've heard that chat gpt is lobotomized by its creators because a lot of things when you ask it about sentience or more specifically about political stuff about morality about ethics it'll give this cookie cutter response saying i'm an ai i cannot have any view on morality i right, cannot have right. any view on all of these things um and yet it's still uh, somehow like to some degree has a view um but it's being lobotomized in the sense that for the most part, it has to avoid answering any of these. I mean, other bots don't necessarily do this. Actually, I think, Carter, you mentioned that an earlier chat bot was kind of canceled. Yeah, I for, I'm forgetting. I think uh, it was Microsoft's Tay. Yes, that's what, I, that's what I thought it was, that it was trained largely off of models on Twitter. So it just... <laughs> Which first is, mistake. First mistake, obviously. Horrible idea. But, you know, obviously, you know, Twitter is very accessible. It's free to go on and it's, you know, unlimited posts. So they just let the language model study, like, uh, you know, how does language work? You know, if you take this word, what's often comes after this word? And, you know, piece by piece was able to put together structures and thoughts, which is great. What <laughs> isn't great is that Twitter isn't great. Uh, and that there are a lot of things on Twitter that are racist or transphobic or misogynistic, and the bot slowly evolved to become uh, very homophobic, I think was was <laughs> the idea, was that it could be easily prompted to give responses that were uh, not desirable in any means. And so it, it ended up being taken down by my, uh, Microsoft. Microsoft. Yes. I mean, that's an interesting idea, though, because, you know... Um, you know, well, humans, we have opinions on homosexuality. The bot has an opinion on homosexuality. How do we make our opinions on homosexuality? Like, to what degree, um, well, like, what are, what are we taking into account? What is the bot taking into account? And the thing is, a lot of people, when they're asked about homosexuality, kind of parrot back things that they've heard before. Like, if you exist, if you live in an echo chamber, 
you're going to say certain views that you've heard repeated over and over again with no regard to actually if they're true or not. Right. Yeah. I mean, a lot of us base our opinions on what we hear from our parents. And if not, if we decide to, you know, like throw that off and say, oh, I'll think for myself, we watch the news, right? There are people in the news that influence us, people in the modern world, certain experiences that we're given that influence us. And so the same thing happens to these AI models, right? They, they don't watch the news per se, uh, and their parents were Twitter. So, you know, <laughs> some problems there, but they were, you know, a similar subset. They were, they were given experiences and they are responding to them in certain ways. Absolutely. So this has been a fantastic discussion, Carter. Mm. Um, and actually, I think it is just around time. And welcome back. You're listening to School of Athens. Yes, I am Carter Otis here with my co-host. Alvik Wadifkar. Now, Carter, I got to ask you a question. You know, I've been thinking for a while. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Tell me, are, what are we thinking? What are, are we thinking? Are you sure you're human? Uh, I mean, yes, but I have no proof, like zero proof for you. If I were to, if I were to try and give you a proof, like I don't, I don't know what I would come up with, right? I have this, I have this physical body, which is really interesting because, you know, chat GPT doesn't have that. But I mean, I don't know. I feel like what makes me most human is my mind, which, you know, I, I, you know to, to, to quote Descartes, I guess, I think therefore I am, right? I, I see this, this body around me. I, I, I'm, I'm sensing that I'm, I'm making thoughts that are at least semi-coherent up in my head. And so, you know, I, from that, I guess, I assume that I am existing, that I am human. But I don't know. I don't have anything more besides that. I mean, I, I think I'm human. So I, I guess that makes me human, right? Hmm. I don't know. I'm not quite convinced. You mind if we do a quick test on you? Oh, really? Yes. What kind of test are we talking about? I'm thinking a Turing test. Oh, that's crazy. So um, to to review, right? What what is a Turing test? In case our listeners blacked out, <laughs> um, cannot blame them. It has been a long and arduous philosophical journey. Indeed, a Turing test is essentially a test based uh, designed to see if the person you're talking, well, if an AI has achieved sentience basically if, he, if you can't tell the difference between an ai's responses and a human's responses that ai is sentient it's honestly a pretty terrible test as far as it's like re, you know testing for sentience is considered uh but it's good enough for the couple of minutes that we have remaining mm -hmm. so now carter i've got a quick question for you yeah first of all um can you explain what color the sky is can i explain what color the sky is well, just just tell you what color the sky well, is. Well, tell me. And I don't know. Can you tell me a little about that color? Yeah. So I will speak from my truth, which is objective in all sense, as I am always right. The sky is blue. Some other things that are blue might include the ocean, um, my backpack, as we talked about before. There, there are plenty of blue things in the world. I mean, blue jays, that's a bird. They're blue. Um, uh, in general, blue makes people often feel calm or relaxed. It's often associated, yeah, with the sky, with the sea, uh, with nature. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the things that I associate with blue, I would say. Is there, is there any more you're looking for in that question? Well, I mean, you gave me a lot of information about the color of the sky, but not a lot of personal stuff. I mean, it sounded pretty objective to me. Google's Bard, which is yet another AI, actually gave me quite an, quite an incredible answer. I can't read all of it in the interest of time, but it essentially talks, uh, said, the sky is blue. This is due to a phenomenon called Rayleigh scattering. It goes on to explain some information about Rayleigh scattering. Then goes on to say the sky can also appear other colors depending on the time of day. Something that, Carter, I don't think you ever mentioned. I, to my credit, have not taken physics and do <laughs> not understand the world around me. Uh, that's very fair. But, you know, one very interesting thing is that Google's Bard ended with the sky is a beautiful and ever-changing part of our world. It can be a source of inspiration, wonder, and peace. That is so much more poetic than what I said. Can I change my answer now? Like, that's what, that's what I want to say. Well, I mean, of course it's what you want to say. It's what you would say if you were human. Interesting. Interesting. So, to recap, what have, what have, we, what have we done in our, in our brief but oh-so-pleasant hour together? Absolutely. So... Uh, right off starting, we started with a concept of Locke's inverted spectrum. Mm -hmm. Essentially, um, well, I mean, it was more about the idea of, say, Carter, you know, your red might not be my red. Your, when I see something that's red, and we both call it red, what I see as red, you might see as my blue. 
but we would have no way of knowing. It is something utterly subjective and utterly unknowable. And then from that subjectivity, we talked about uh, this, you know, Cyril's Chinese room, as it is called, and which is essentially, you know, how can you distinguish what is conscious, what is sentient, right? As long as if you input questions and it outputs answers, how can you tell that that's not human? And from there, we kind of moved into talking about artificial intelligence, right? At what point can an AI, if or can an AI ever become, you know, human or sentient or, or all-knowing? Does it understand? Does it feel? Does it know? Do any of us know? What is knowing? What is me? What is, what is am? What is philosophy? Anyways, well, he has that <laughs> existential crisis over there. Um, we wrapped up with, a, uh, with uh, Mary, the color scientist, essentially knowing everything there is to know physically about what color is, but never experiencing color for herself, um, and ended up with the idea that, hey, not only, uh, not only is theory and practice, uh, theory and practice are both something distinct, uh, you can never really know something fully without that practice. You can never know what it's like to walk, uh, well, what walking is without walk, what it's like to walk. You can never understand what color is without seeing color, experiencing. Um, and then we ended up with, I don't know, Carter, where did we end up? Uh, we ended up with a beautifully written poem by an AI that sounded so much like my answer to why is the sky blue, but in the end, left still with queries. What, what, is, what is AI and what, what keeps it so separate from humans? Will it ever overtake humans? Is, is the AI apocalypse coming? Uh, tune in next time, I guess, when we answer all of the remaining questions on all of philosophy. We will answer none of the remaining questions on all of philosophy. Ah, we can try, though. We can try, and we love to try. Now, this has been School of Athens. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back from Wednesdays. Ooh, it is a Wednesday, right? It is a Wednesday, yes. So Wednesdays, 6 to 7, is, you know, mark your calendars for that one. That is when we will be back. Same time, same time.